You're listening to the Fix the Money, Fix the World Show on the Bitcoin Made Simple Podcast Network. Here's your host, Luke Mikic. Welcome back to the podcast, guys. I hope you're doing well. And today we're going to be answering some hard hitting questions that not a lot of people like to discuss. And the main question is, who is Klaus Schwab? Okay, because I actually had the pleasure of sitting down with the man who's created the website titled www.whoisklausschwab.com. No, I'm not joking. If you Google that right now, whoisklausschwab.com, you will see a website with all sorts of receipts exposing Klaus Schwab for who he really is. So today we're going to be discussing who is Klaus Schwab, who does he work for, and what influence does he have on your, uh, on what we think are democratically elected uh, independent governments all around the world. Because uh, Klaus Schwab has some uh, influence over these governments that most people aren't aware of. Uh, so we're going to check all of that out. Um, we are also going to be talking about Bitcoin. Uh, because my guest today, Brian, uh, he has created a Bitcoin meetup in Kansas City. Uh, so obviously, we're going to be talking about the Bitcoin meetup scene in the United States. We're going to be talking about what went down at the Bitcoin Miami 2022 conference last week because we both attended, but we sadly didn't get the chance to bump into each other because we only met this week. Uh, and we also talk about an amazing article he wrote um, comparing uh, Bitcoin to the printing press. Uh, for those of you who know, the printing press was a technology uh, created in the 1400s and it actually enabled the separation of church and state 500 years ago. And Brian and I both believe that Bitcoin, like the printing press, is going to enable a revolution. And we believe that Bitcoin will be used to separate money from state. So we're going to talk about that because that is probably the most important aspect of Bitcoin. Um, in my opinion, anyway. A uh, little bit of housekeeping too. I just moved into a new house in uh, Comey, California, and I was kind of scrambling, trying to get my setup for this morning, and I just couldn't find a good position to have my laptop and my video when I was recording. So it was really bad. The lighting was terrible. So in the introduction, you will notice I just slapped my emoji um, over my screen there for a little bit. For the majority of the podcast, we are screen sharing though. And we're actually going through all of the receipts on Brian's website. So uh, if, you, if you're tuning in on the podcasting platforms, be sure to check out the video that he streamed on YouTube. If you want to see what Brian and I are discussing on his amazing website, who is Clash? Schwab.com. Uh, but we should probably hear from today's show sponsors who make today's episode uh, useful. Uh, we, we talk about the cyber polygon cyber attack, okay, that Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum is predicting about. And I reckon if you've got Bitcoin on an exchange during a cyber attack, that Bitcoin is not your Bitcoin, okay? So what you want to do is you want to take self-custody of your Bitcoin. You always hear Bitcoiners talk about not your keys, not your coins. And if you don't hold your own Bitcoin in a secure hardware wallet, you don't actually own the Bitcoin. So I would recommend you actually go and get set up with a Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. You guys know that I've used all the hardware wallets in the Bitcoin space. I've used a cold card. I've used a ledger. I've used a Trezor. I've also created my own multi-sig setup with open source software like Spectre. And I can tell you, the Bitbox O2 is the easiest, simplest hardware wallet I have ever used. You can get up and running in five minutes. So I highly recommend you learn about self-custody. If you have any questions, hit me up, honestly. Um, the, my Twitter handle is in the description of every single video on YouTube or Apple Podcasts. And I invite the listener to always hit me up in the DMs. I am happy to help you if you have any questions about self-custody. I can send you articles about where to go um, and what to kind of learn. Okay, so hit me up. I can help you. Um, if you want to grab a Bitbox O2 hardware wallet for yourself, you can get 5% off if you use promo code Bitcoin Made Simple. Uh, that is at shiftcrypto.io. Get yourself a Bitcoin only Bitbox O2. And final little piece of housekeeping here for anyone listening in on the Fix the Money, Fix the World YouTube channel. For any of you who don't know, I am actually posting all of my content under the Bitcoin Made Simple podcast network. My show name is what I'm circling right now 
FTM008. You guys will actually be listening in to FTM012. So that's uh, episode number 12 of the Fix the Money, Fix the World show over on the Bitcoin Made Simple podcast network. For, for any of you who has been wondering, oh, where's Luke recently? Why hasn't he been posting so much content um, on this YouTube channel? That is because I'm posting all my regular content over here on the Bitcoin Made Simple podcast network. I'm showing you guys how to find it. You simply type Bitcoin Made Simple into YouTube or even into your favorite podcasting platform like Spotify. Uh, We live stream on Twitter. We're also on the podcasting app that's downloaded onto your iPhone if you have one. This is our logo here, Bitcoin Made Simple. You head on over here and you will find all of my shows posted to this channel. There is three of us um, that post regularly to this channel that is core Phil and myself, we are all uh, happy co-hosts over on the Bitcoin Made Simple Podcast Network. So head on over there, hit that big subscribe button so you don't miss any of my regular content and you'll see that my regular uh, videos are posted here. So um, over on the Fix the Money, Fix the World show, you guys only had Fix the Money 8 and 12. Well, here you can see is episode number 11. Obviously, every single episode gets posted here, uh, plus so much more. We also do a weekly news um, a weekly news episode between the three of us where Phil, Corey and myself all break down the news. We call that one News Made Simple on the Bitcoin Made Simple podcast network. So head on over there, subscribe to that channel and I'll see you guys um, in the next episode. So welcome back to the Fix the Money, Fix the World podcast. Today I'm sitting down with a man, a Bitcoiner of many talents, which I'm sure we're going to get into uh, firstly, Brian, thank you so much for coming on, my friend. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. No, anytime. I'm really looking forward to this one. I mean, a lot of Bitcoiners, uh, they like to ask the hard-hitting questions like, who is Klaus Schwab and what is the World Economic Forum? And today I have the pleasure of sitting down with a man who owns the domain name, who is Klausschwab.com. <laughs> and no, yes. we're not joking. If you punch that into Google, you will find Brian's website. Um, but before we get into all of that, maybe Brian, you can give the listeners a little bit of your rabbit hole journey and you're doing lots of things in Bitcoin at the moment. So maybe your rabbit hole journey will tell us how you ended up doing all sorts of different things in the Bitcoin space. So maybe we should start. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would say I wasn't very aware of anything like the world economic forum or the imf or the biz or anything like that uh, before bitcoin um i i mean i had always read things like 1984 things like that so i was kind of aware that there's probably some things going on like that in the world and it wasn't until i started down the bitcoin rabbit hole that i started asking a lot of the questions that i think a lot of bitcoiners have found themselves asking of like okay what is money who controls that money. And so that led me um, to this, who is Klaus Schwab rabbit hole. (laughs) Uh, And that was more like, once again, I I was, um, I was aware of some of it, but then I'm a big uh, Tales from the Crypt fan. And so I was listening to that, listening to like Marty Bent and that's where the the whole hoops. Shout out to the freaks. Yeah, That's where the whole uh, who is Klaus Schwab thing came from, of course. So uh, my friends here, we, we love buying domain names. <laughs> it's kind of our guilty pleasure. And so I heard that. I was like, I want to see if that's available. Surely, surely someone has it. So I bought it. And then uh, it wasn't till Miami that uh, I ran into Marty and he's like, dude, you've got to turn that into a whole site. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, for sure. So uh, I kind of, I'd been down the rabbit hole continue to go down the rabbit hole a little bit more as I put together this site. And, uh, I, I would say that as I built it, I was aware, but I mean, this stuff's kind of disgusting. I had to take a few showers in between to <laughs> rinse off all the filth. <laughs> it's so true, my friend. It's so true. Um, and yeah. so this was only recently, um, this was Miami Bitcoin 2022 for the listeners. Um, you ran into Marty Bent himself and, that's what spurred you to start the website. Yeah, he was, we were just talking about the domain name. I had, I think Mm -hmm. I tweeted at him before, uh, that I owned it. I originally had it, um, just forwarding to TF 
tc.io. And so then we were talking and we ran into each other at a bar and we were talking about it. And he's like, dude, you need a, uh, you know, WTF happened in 1971 sort of site and just list, you know, Klaus Schwab eating bugs and stuff. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, yeah, that'd be easy enough. So then I pretty much started building it as soon as I got back from Miami and here we are. And you, you certainly, uh, you certainly done great work on building it. Um, something you yeah, mentioned that. there that I want to double click on before we uh, run past it was um, you weren't aware of all of this before you found Bitcoin. And then that was the exact same story with me. I always knew something was wrong. I always knew something was fucked up with the financial system. I always saw the rich getting richer and, you know, us plebs struggling to get ahead in our everyday life, but I just couldn't make the connections. And, you know, and, but when you find Bitcoin, it, kind of motivates you to really start doing the work in all aspects of your life. And I went down the same rabbit holes as you brother and all these connections that the world economic forum have are certainly interesting. Um, so let's start, <laughs> let's start breaking down the website um, for okay. listeners on the podcasting platforms. Um, if you head over to the YouTube video, I am screen sharing and we have just typed into Google who is Klaus Schwab.com and Brian's website pops up. <laughs> So we've clicked on that and we're going to walk through some of the receipts. Um, so obviously um, it has a nice link to uh, a Twitter handle. You should all go and follow. Um, who manages that account? Is that you, Brian? That's me. Yeah. Because <laughs> you have a normal Bitcoin account, which will be in the in the show links, uh, which is Correct. just your personal profile. And then you also manage the who is Klaus Schwab. That's right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's and awesome. I'll, you, I'll even like preface this conversation with whenever I was building this, uh, you know, there's a lot of funny quotes out there about Klaus Schwab of, you know, eat the bugs and things like that. Uh, but I tried not to really, I think I used one of those memes in this site, but I try to really use stuff that can be traced to, um, you know, actual like World Economic Forum posts or World Economic Forum like websites, um, just to show that this is real stuff and they're saying exactly who they are. And so I try to put those links on each one of the pictures as well. hundred percent. And like, this is, this is a website you can literally send to family members who are skeptical of um, our, us Bitcoiners and our uh, red pill journeys, because it's all, there's no memes. There's no, I, I've looked at everything and it all, it all checks out. Um, up on screen at the moment, we have a couple of posts about bugs in the world economic forum. <laughs> couple of posts straight from their website why we need to give insects the role they deserve in our food systems and that's a post from the world economic forum exactly it's what so what do you think um obviously bitcoin is i i'm a carnivore kind of myself um my i personally think the push towards bugs is they just want us to be unhealthy they want us to be unfit um, and I think they can make much higher profit margins on the bugs. But what's, what's your thinking? What is this big push against red meat? Um, and why are they pushing us towards it, all this processed crap? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, they want weak people who can't fight back. Um, mm. I mean, some of it might even be just the control aspect of getting people to eat bugs. <laughs> you know, these, <laughs> yeah. these people are evil and no one in their right mind would want their neighbor to eat bugs. You know, I don't want my enemies to eat bugs. Um, these are evil people that are just concerned about control. Like, you know, it. they'll, if you look at this site, the push for bugs. And there's so, there's so many articles on their website about eating bugs, which I try to put some of it here, but I didn't want to do overload. Um, but I mean, like they'll, they'll blame the climate for it. They'll say cattle are, you know, putting off too much carbon, whatever that means. <laughs> and cows are farting too much, Brian. It, cows are farting too much. <laughs> Boiling the ocean. And, that's right. It's the cows that have been here for thousands of years. It's their fault. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's, uh, it's about control. I'm sure, you know, they're not going to be eating bugs. You can guarantee that. Oh yeah. 
same as same as uh, they're trying to crack down on our traveling during the uh, let's call it the cerveza sickness uh, to not get this video <laughs> knocked off down on YouTube. But um, whenever, so they've been cracking down on our traveling during the lockdowns and all this kind of thing, but the hypocrisy, it's astounding because they fly their private jets around everywhere. And I'm sure, like you just said, they won't be eating the bug burgers. They'll be pushing the bug burgers on us and they'll be eating exactly. their delicious uh, Scotch fillet steaks. I'm sure of that. Um, but I think, yeah, the climate change is another big one. Um, I think I'm not sure whether they actually believe the, the climate change crap that they talk about because um, they're all Malthusians. Um, I think when I, I, looked at, I looked at the World Economic Forum and they hold these annual Davos meetings or these annual, uh, these annual get-togethers, I think in 1971 when the World Economic Forum was founded, um, in the very next year, I think their, their annual get together was based um, on, I think it was talking about population control and how we're going to consume all of the planet's finite resources. So this kind of Malthusian ideology, you know, they've been, they were talking about it when the World Economic Forum was founded. And I, I'm not sure whether it's just incompetence or evil, or I'm not sure whether they believe this whole Malthusian ideology even though it's been proved wrong for decades but it's... i mean i would i would definitely say it's evil it mm. it's one of those watch what i you know watch what i do not what i say sort of things or vice versa you know they if you look at the davos meeting they've they come in on 400 private planes yep. they have these you know huge lines of cars like they don't care <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they want to make sure that they can do that um and they want to limit travel of other people a hundred percent, dude. hundred percent. Um, maybe having a look at something else on the website, I was, um, so I was doing a video for my uh, boss, Mark, and I was doing like all the research and grabbing all the receipts for him. And we went down the world economic forum rabbit hole. And I was astounded at this young global leaders program, mm -hmm. because when you take a look at the presidents all around the world, so in democratic countries as well. So people like, uh, my ex country in Australia, Scott Morrison, uh, you got New Zealand with Jacinta Ardern, Emmanuel Macron from France. When you start having a look at Klaus Schwab's little training programs, you notice that every single one of them were all part of this young global leaders program. So what did you think and, when you stumbled across those receipts? You know, the, the kind of funny thing is, is I have noticed this, um, there's a correlation, it seems, between uh, people in the World Economic Forum and Ethereum. Yes. Um, and I was, of course, I was in the, um, the speech of Peter Thiel down in Miami. And did you, ha did you happen to listen to that? Yeah, dude. Yeah. And, you know, at the beginning, he starts like talking about the use case of Ethereum. Mm. And I look at the person next to me and I'm like, dude, that makes me think he's uh, he's somehow uh, involved with the World Economic Forum. And I said that to a couple of people and they're like, no, dude, like no chance. And then, of course, I come back and I go to this website and there's Peter Thiel on it. <laughs> wow. I, I didn't see the Peter Thiel website. He's a young global leader. Yeah, he's on there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. That's interesting because you're, I've seen other connections with uh, the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, one of the yeah, one right of the, there, right above Zuckerberg. Yeah. Yeah. Zuckerberg as well. That there's, yep. Peter Thiel, Mark Zuckerberg, all part of the Young Global Leaders program that are hand trained by Mr. Klaus Schwab himself. <laughs> so I, I, right. I think it's interesting. Um, and there's also another lady. Um, who's part of the Ethereum Foundation, um, and she's also um, she's also a young global leader. I might pull it up so you see if I can find her name. Ethereum Foundation, World Economic. Yeah, I forget her name. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, here she is, Aya Mayaguchi. Uh, she's supposedly part of the World Economic Forum, and also um joins the ethereum foundation as the executive director um so i i, I think uh alex spetsky always talks about this 
And he says the biggest attack on Bitcoin is actually crypto. It's not, it's, it's, that's their kind of attack avenue uh, because obviously they can, they can control the other 12 or 15,000 coins because they're mm-hmm. not decentralized. And obviously that's why we Bitcoin. And I, I think I noticed you guys are Bitcoin only as well in your, that's right. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah. It's the so, only yeah, thing that I makes think sense. You this, is, I, this is, this is probably the biggest reason I point people away from Ethereum, honestly, is mm-hmm. ever since I kind of stumbled across this correlation, I really think that this is, I don't know if it started and then they decided they were going to try to use Ethereum as their weapon or if, you know, that's kind of how it started. But I think this was probably what they thought is their best bet to take on uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, me too, dude. I think in 2013, when Silk Road got shut down, I remember at least uh, watching a video from a, a lady who was part of the US government and she was saying, look, we can't shut down Bitcoin. It's too late. It's too distributed. I think this was in 2013. So I think they've mm. kind of been formulating um, social attacks against Bitcoin since then. Because obviously, I think around that time frame, 2013, 2014, that's when that narrative came out about it's blockchain, not Bitcoin. And all the banks mm-hmm. started talking about that. So I that's that what originally kept me uh, out of Bitcoin. I heard about Bitcoin for the first time around then. And, you know, trying to sound smart with friends, I'd be like, oh, it's, you know, it's blockchain, not Bitcoin. And <laughs> <laughs> I knew nothing what I was talking about. And later I realized how stupid I was, but <laughs> they convinced we, me for a while. And we've all been there, man. I was a... Uh, I was trading shit coins back when I found Bitcoin. That's uh, <laughs> it's, it's a steep learning curve. Um, but yeah, just speaking, just before we round out this kind of look at the website, we can see like the metaverse. What what is the World mm-hmm. Economic Forum's obsession with the metaverse? What? what yeah. What do you oh, think? Go on. No, no, I was just going to say, do you, are, is they going to try and co-opt? uh this whole metaverse is it going to be like uh what's that movie ready player one where they've mm-hmm. got us locked in our little pods and we're we're in our little virtual lands controlled by zuckerberg yeah i think it uh i think that movie's probably more spot on than i'd like to believe um, <laughs> except except the creator of the metaverse in that movie is kind of this altruistic mm. guy which i don't buy in our real world um i I I put the metaverse stuff in there because, uh, of course, that last name on the uh, young global leaders is Zuckerberg. Mm. And so I'm like, OK, well, that's an interesting uh, correlation. So then I I think I just searched metaverse on the World Economic Forum site. And if you scroll up, you see how many recent articles alone that they have on the metaverse. I mean, Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, that's seven. I mean, what do we got there? 19, 20 yeah. <laughs> articles yeah. just on the metaverse. And so then I put excerpts under that of some of those articles that I found the most interesting. Um, and you see that they are, one, really trying to push towards, um, you know, normalizing it, first of all. Um, second, that it's actually going to be this place that we live, do business. Um, I mean, I think this is one of the most dangerous things that's on the horizon. Cause I think, mm-hmm. I mean, I think Bitcoiners for the most part are going to be pretty smart of, you know, we're very like build your Citadel, <laughs> you know, get some land and some, uh, some cattle, things like that. I mean, seems to be a pretty new, uh, Bitcoin or trend, which is awesome. And I think that we'll stay away from the metaverse for the most part, but there's going to be people that are trapped in this thing, who live in this thing and who just quit being able to function in society because of the metaverse. Um, another thing I found pretty interesting is that if you look at a lot of these articles, and this goes across all the World Economic Forum Uh, articles I read, but the implication for all of them is you need us uh, to keep you safe uh, Mm. and to help you. I mean, all those articles are pretty much, this is the world that is coming, uh, except the metaverse, but there's going to be a lot of dangers. And so we need to be able to like uh, regulate it and keep it safe for you. So trust us. Mm. That's what it always goes back to. 
uh, mm-hmm. the lockdowns are for your safety, yep. uh, XYZs for your safety. And I, I agree with you. I think it's absolutely horrifying. Um, I think it's nice to see that Bitcoiners are getting out of cities because I think the whole lockdowns in 2020 showed just how vulnerable that situation can be. Um, the government can literally lock you down in your city and you can't, you can't move more than a five kilometer radius from your home for months on end in Melbourne or Sydney and Australia. And people saw that and thought, Oh shit, this is not where I want to be long term. I want to be out. I want to be out. I want to have some land in a rural area somewhere where I can grow my own food. So I'm not reliant on these bug burgers. (laughs) That's right. I do. I saw a stat here. Um, A quarter of people will spend at least an hour a day in the metaverse by 2026 research yep. shows <laughs> that, that's what they want uh, i mean an hour a day come on yeah yeah i mean yep. i grew up with video games are bad you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was supposed to live in them yeah i'm certainly i'm certainly won't be living in the pods and i certainly won't be eating the bugs or i won't be in their little metaverse that's for sure um no. maybe maybe shifting gears a little bit brian um I read your amazing article that you posted on Bitcoin magazine. Um, so what I would love to ask before I get into some of the really cool quotes that I found in there, what kind of spurred you to, to write the article? Is it something to do with your background or what made you write Bitcoin from that kind of lens? Yeah. So uh, in college, I was a, um, I was actually a Bible major and then uh, worked in, uh, you know, the travel industry for about five years, decided to go back and getting a master's at counseling now. Um, but it was really, I was having a conversation with um, my mom. She works for a ministry and they have to send like money across the globe all the time. And so she was basically telling me about a tough situation that they had where Um, someone had to, um, they had to get money in, into somewhere. And it took about three weeks using Western union. (laughs) And I realized, oh, Bitcoin fixes this. (laughs) And so, um, and of course with my background, I've, uh, I know a lot of people who are missionaries who, um, are around the globe and have, who have to do fundraising and that can be very difficult. You're, of course, involving third parties in that. Um, you pretty much have to rely on third parties a lot of times to get money in and out of where you need it. And so I just started doing some, uh, some thinking about that and realizing that um, the, the uh, church Bitcoin culture, fixes. yeah, church culture can usually, uh, it can be hesitant to accept technology a lot of times. Mm. and they aren't utilizing this technology, which is available right now. Like right now they could be using this to help people across the globe. And so I just started typing and um, yeah, I I, I kind of saw that comparison of Gutenberg uh, and the press with Bitcoin and realizing that, you know, it was the Gutenberg press that um, really launched the reformation. And so if we accept a technology, then as a church, why aren't we accepting that technology now? <laughs> that's a, that's a brilliant connection, dude. And that kind of ties into the first quote I pulled from the article. Uh, I'll read it out for the listeners. You pretty much say this in the first paragraph, you go from Gutenberg to Google for the last six centuries, the church's ability to utilize innovation has led to further expansion of the gospel. I I Mm -hmm. just thought that was brilliant. Um, And (laughs) I think a a lot of people are resistant to new technologies, but if you can especially say, Hey, look, this technology, the printing press, it it helped you and your culture 500 years ago. I think, I think Bitcoin's very similar vein and it's going to do something very similar to what the printing press did 500 years ago. So. Yeah. And both are, yeah, both are just helping spread information. Exactly. And that's why even in the article, I, I try to say how we've done this even recently, like Gutenberg, that seems like a stress or a stretch uh, to some like, oh, well, you know, hundreds of years ago, uh, 
that's hard. I think some people have a hard time connecting that with actual technology because we think technology, we think phones, computers, TVs. And so even seeing how TVs and the internet have been used for that same cause within the last hundred years. Yeah, I thought that was amazing, dude. Um, I thought it was really, really good. Um, something yeah, else, you. You got, we got a little bit of a... I, I was surprised there was 2.3 billion Christians. Uh, that was something that surprised me. I didn't know that Christianity was so... It, it, it had proliferated across the world so, so much. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was really yeah. interesting. And they all could do better with Bitcoin. Bitcoin That's can, right. <laughs> Bitcoin can help everyone, not just the 2.3 billion Christians, but um i i think something else you say in the article uh, when johannes gutenberg created the printing press he gave mankind the ability to spread information via books faster than ever before and then when satoshi nakamoto created bitcoin he gave mankind the ability to spread information via a monetary network faster than ever before that was that was brilliant i really really enjoyed that one um how do you see so obviously uh, with the Gutenberg press, um, it obviously led to the Reformation and it ultimately uh, brought about the fracturing of the power between the church and state back in the 1500s. And these, these centralized established institutions fought back pretty hard against this technology. Um, do you think that Bitcoin faces a similar challenge today? Do you think that maybe... Uh, Bitcoin offers the potential to separate money from state. Do you think that the entities that control the money and the state are going to potentially push back against us Bitcoiners? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hence the website. I, th- <laughs> so website. I, I definitely see where uh, there's comparisons. Of course, we're going to have challenges that um, they didn't have against the Roman Catholic church. Uh, but there's also going to be things we don't have to deal with, you know, for them, it was a printing press and books, which led to book burnings and, um, you know, uh, it, it was, you know, obviously much more visible there, um, what they were doing. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, which I can just store in my head and they can't, burn that well i guess you know hopefully they don't try to burn that don't but, class. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> don't want to give anyone ideas yeah. but uh yeah I, I think that i think it's going to be interesting to see how they truly do fight back we kind of mentioned ethereum might have been that first effort as we're seeing regulation uh start to pop up or politicians posturing in that direction uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they try. I don't even know if we've received their hardest punch yet. But just like the Reformation with the printing press, you know, we're going to win. I couldn't agree more, dude. I, I, I really, really, I really do think we're going to win, but I do question whether we have received their hardest punch or not yet. Um, I personally escaped Australia just because I expect punches mm. to continue to come. Um, yeah. It, and it kind of goes to that whole thing that you read uh, from the article of spreading information. Mm. Uh, it's hard to suppress the, the spread of information that travels quickly. And that's what the printing press did. And so Bitcoin spreads information much faster. And so I think it's going to be that much harder for them to stop. I, I really do agree on that. Um, I think a lot of people are looking at the next decade or even I was talking to someone yesterday who said he sees the next couple of decades being potentially a a really kind of gruesome fight between the state and the sovereign individual. But I kind of, I'm in the same boat as you, like information is spreading so quickly these days. Um, I, I, I don't think that, I don't think that we'll have to be bunkered down for decades upon decades. I, I really see everything escalating in the next handful of years in particular. Um, yeah. And they're, they're playing their hand faster than I think they wanted to ooh, because yeah. of Bitcoin. And so, I mean, this, this decade is going to be fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. There's, there's scary parts to it, but I really think this is the best time ever to be alive. Um, 
to say, to say we lived in this, this period. I mean, I think it's going to be uh, amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I I 100% agree with you. Um, and not just lived in this period, but being switched on to what's actually going on. That's the mm-hmm. really interesting part. Um, like this is this is absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm I'm lucky enough to be in Bitcoin 24/7 full time now. <laughs> so, like my job is just to follow um, all of the crazy things that are that are happening all around the world. Like. Uh, Russia, the whole Russia just had six hundred billion dollars of its central bank reserves frozen last month, and it's. I, I think everybody's been woken up to the fact that they need Bitcoin. Um, actually, speaking of Russia and nation states, mm-hmm. what what do you think Russia is going to accept Bitcoin? Because I think Putin said, "Hey, look," or maybe one of Putin's advisors said, "Hey, look, we're going to accept Bitcoin as." Uh, for our oil and gas we're going to accept rubles gold and bitcoin um what did you think about that and maybe which countries do you see over the next few handful of years that are going to be uh potentially favorable uh towards bitcoin and maybe even adopt it yeah i mean i i don't maybe i'm bearish i've been bearish recently but (laughs) i i don't think it's ever going to happen as quickly as we think it will. I think, uh, man, it's just tough to know. I think all these countries, even these evil powers of the world economic forum are way smarter than we give them credit for a lot of times. And I think they understand what a threat Bitcoin is, uh, for, and just in, in my opinion, for Russia to accept it, it is going to be the energy markets. And I think as we see uh, more of these companies experimenting with uh, the mining aspects and how they can use that to unlock energy, that'll be what it is. I have a hard time believing Russia's going to just start accepting Bitcoin or uh, transacting in it. Seems like the, uh, the incentive for them is to team up with China or you know, something like that using the digital yuan, but I also know nothing. So uh, <laughs> you and me the, both, brother. We're, oh, I'm just trying to learn. I, I I love to speculate, but the countries that I would, I, I mean, it seems like Latin America has a, the most to gain in a lot of uh, a lot of ways, and mm-hmm. I think it's really cool what's going on down there. With of course El Salvador, we're seeing Bitcoin Lake. Um, it seems like it's just fertile soil for Bitcoin. And I would imagine those are the countries that accept it first. Um, but might be a great opportunity to move down there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's actually where I'm going. If I, uh, if I get kicked out of the States at the end of my uh, 90 (laughs) days, I'm going to, uh, probably Mexico. And if I can't get back into the States, I'll probably go to Honduras. I think they just recently, um announced that the bitcoin 2022 conference that uh, a little island or maybe a little city within honduras has made bitcoin legal yeah. tender it's like 40 acres <laughs> yeah is it is that all it is it's 40 acres. it's pretty small i think <laughs> oh, shit. that puts a bit of a target on your head i don't that's a bit too small for my liking yeah that's you're gonna maybe, be noticed maybe that area in portugal um i think because there's a yeah. city or an island in portugal that also said the same thing um what are your thoughts are you gonna because hey, don't dox yourself but you're in america at the moment aren't you um, that's have right you, uh, have you ever considered any of these little bitcoin citadels popping up around the world well i uh i mean they sound fun and i hate cold weather um mm-hmm. but i'm also i mean i this is on Twitter, so I'm not really doxing myself. I mean, I'm a Missouri maxi. So um, this is the greatest state in the union. I'll say it a thousand times. And so, <laughs> <Be cool. laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty community, like committed to my community. Uh, if something came up and I had an opportunity to do something, there's pretty once in a lifetime um, with, you know, Bitcoin and one of those, you know, nation states or whatnot. I'm not saying I would turn it down, but I'm also not the one who's just trying to run away from perceived problems that uh, seem to be popping up uh, with regulation, legislation, and whatnot. And so 
currently very committed to uh, to where I am. I think that's I think that's brilliant, and I think more Americans need to have that mindset um, because you actually do have a chance to change things in mm-hmm. America. You have you have this republic kind of set up. And just that kind of ability isn't the same in basic basic monarchies like the UK and Australia. You just don't have the same ability to change mm-hmm. things. So I, I would um, I would encourage all US Bitcoiners to do the same thing. Stay and fight because when I look around the world, there's not many better places for freedom or fighting this potential pushback that may come than say america or latin america as well i really do like latin america but um obviously a little bit of a different living standard down there than it is (laughs) in america um you mentioned your home state dude maybe you can tell us a little bit about the meetup scene um for sure where you're at because i believe you've had a hand in some of the local meetups down there so what's going on in missouri is that right yeah that's right that's right um so I mean, Missouri is a pretty free state for the most part. We uh, we have some pretty like liberal cities, but um, the state itself is fairly conservative. So throughout the last two years, had had a good amount of just like freedom, not many mask mandates or anything like that around. Uh, so it was uh, my cousin who actually orange pilled me to Bitcoin, and it was it, it was a year ago yesterday where we started uh he, he's more the uh, the brainchild behind it but i was there for its founding um at the kansas city bitcoin meetup and so um you know we're both passionate about bitcoin education helping people uh, and communities really understand like what a bitcoin standard could do mm-hmm. and so we started that meetup uh, it's out of uh, that that um We've met, you know, such a great community where, um, you know, even this weekend, we've got a Bitcoin block party here in Kansas City. So if you're listening and you're coming through Kansas City, it's going to be it's going to be pretty awesome. We've got uh, like seven vendors who are all accepting Bitcoin for their products. We've got food and drinks and there's going to be live music. It's going to be great. And so, like I said, I'm very invested in helping my community understand Bitcoin and building something here. And so I'm very bullish on meetups, uh, bullish on Bitcoiners, and I'm bullish on uh, Missouri. (laughs) I love that. There you go, plebs. Bullish on the Kansas City Bitcoin meetup. (laughs) That's right. That's happening this weekend. So that's going to put some pressure on me to pump this out the next day or maybe even (laughs) later today. (laughs) So hopefully there are some Bitcoiners listening in the Kansas City region and they head on down and say g'day to Brian and ask him the big questions like, who is Klaus Schwab? Who is Klaus Schwab? <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome, dude. That's really cool that you've started the meetup. I think that's great. I think more Bitcoiners are going to do that. I'm actually thinking about doing the same thing in the town that I'm staying at in uh, California. Um, I'm, I'm out of the ghetto and the commie and the blue parts of Cali. It's in, <laughs> I am in a red county. So um, and thinking about doing the same thing. Um, There's yeah, great, great meetup scenes out there, too. There is, there is, yeah, there, there really is. Um, but you can never have too many meetups because um, meeting Bitcoin is in person. It's a beautiful thing. Um, That's right. What did you think about, obviously I only uh, met you this week, so we didn't have the chance to meet in person at the Bitcoin Miami 2022 conference. Um, what were your thoughts on it? How did you enjoy it, dude? Yeah, I had a great time. I thought uh, it was well done. Uh, of course, there's way too many nft ads and (laughs) stuff like that which try to see past for what it is but uh man it's it's just so good being around bitcoiners uh Mm. getting to just connect with a lot of those people uh, a lot of people that you you know you see or hear their podcasts all the time but um i don't know there's there's just a lot of energy down there i think that was way too long to be in Miami. But <laughs> I was so excited to get back, and uh, I think I'm. I need a whole year to to recover. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, brother. I think. I think I had about 
Um, so I was there for five days and I think combined I had less than 10 hours sleep. So I was <laughs> destroyed. I looked like a walk and talk and zombie by the end of it. <laughs> and it was nice to get back home and recover. But yeah, I yeah. echo exactly what you said, man. It was um, amazing to meet Bitcoiners in the flesh because we, we talk on Twitter all day, all day, every day. And mm-hmm. um, getting the chance to meet Bitcoiners from all around the world was fantastic. Um, Do you have any uh, favorite moments from the week? favorite moments uh I, I would honestly have to say meeting the bitcoiners if it was a conference moment in particular um i didn't watch many of the talks um i watched rabbit hole recap live that was pretty funny <laughs> oh, when, i was there uh, for that too yeah <laughs> were you really yeah that's wild um when all the bands stood up with their signs <laughs> at the end <laughs> that was brilliant um yeah who do you who do you side with uh i stand with the bands i stand with the bands. oh really yeah, yeah. I don't shoegate. We have to call shoegate out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was brilliant. That was that was really funny. And that's wild that we were in the same room. That was there's probably what three or four, five hundred people in the open yeah, let's source. Get them out. Yeah, I was just about front and center too. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Well, there you go. We were in the same room at 2022. Um, how about yeah. you, dude? What was your highlight? Uh, I like. Kind of the same. I didn't go to a ton. The I mentioned the Peter Thiel talk. Mm. As I think I was in there for about five minutes after he started, <laughs> it just was going down a weird path. And I'm like, I'm out of here. Uh, I went to the Jordan Peterson. Went to the Jack Mallers, of course. Um, briefly got to meet Jack Mallers, which is pretty cool. That was uh, that's that might have been the yeah that might have been probably the best moment of the i mean the whole thing was great um but that was probably maybe the highlight oh dude that's a highlight meeting yeah meeting the man the myth the legend jack malice um, yeah my uh a buddy of mine uh we were walking up the stairs at the same time as him and we we're kind of like hesitated and then he came over to us and he like fist bumps us he's like what's up guys that's and awesome then, man that's fucking he, awesome uh, there's like a camera that that gets in front of us and starts filming and we're we're like oh sorry do we need to get out of this shot and he's like i need you guys to get in this shot (laughs) so (laughs) and so that we walked with him for five minutes while vice was recording some segment so dude i'd say there's a one percent chance i'm in like a vice clip (laughs) (laughs) oh that's awesome um do you know that video is on the internet anywhere um Uh, I have, I followed Vice hoping uh, that they publish it sometime, but nothing has come about yet. What's this space? Uh, that would be, that'd be awesome. And that's such a great <laughs> yeah. opportunity. Uh, yeah. That's just what the Bitcoin conference is like. Like you see, um, obviously there's big, mostly Bitcoiners listening to this podcast. So that they would know the names of people like Greg Foss or Preston Pish and Andy Edstrom and Jack Mallers uh marty and matt from the towers from the crib it's pretty wild just seeing them mm-hmm. walking around in person at the conference yeah it's, um, how, pretty, well, got, how long do you think that that lasts for how many more conferences that the big names are hanging around yeah i mean even seeing guys like max kaiser walking around mm. you got to think if the price 10x is 100x yeah. x is like they become more and more untouchable <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think people like I think Matt and Marty would probably go undercover um, sooner than most because they understand uh-huh. where the world's going. Um, I think if I had to put a price on it, it's probably another 10 X from here. So when Bitcoin's mm. half a million dollars, I think that's going to bring a lot of attention to it. So um, I, I, I think that's when Bitcoin is start taking their security a little bit more seriously. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we're still fringe at the moment. Uh, I like yeah. to hope. Yeah, that's probably the point where I do go to like a South American country is. <laughs> mm, yeah, just hide out. Hide out for a couple of years. I'm with you there, bro. Yeah. Hide out, Maxi. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you and me both. You'll find me in El Salvador. <laughs> um, dude, I think we've just about, I've had you, kept you for nearly an hour now. Um, and I've just about hit on everything I wanted to um, hit on with you. Um, just in kind of wrapping this one up, is there kind of anywhere that you'd like to send the listeners to, um, learn more about yourself or connect with you or any final thoughts there, dude? Yeah, for sure. So my personal Twitter handles at turbo huddle 
And then um, I, with a couple other KC Bitcoiners, um, Mitch and Don, we do the Orange Pill Addicts podcast. Um, you can also go to orangepilladdicts.com. We've started doing a blog on there as well. And then, of course, who is Klaus Schwab.com. <laughs> and uh, the Twitter account for that is who's Klaus Schwab. <laughs> That's amazing. And good podcast, too, plebs. I've already uh, watched two or three of the episodes from Orange Pill Addicts and highly recommend it. Good bunch of Bitcoiners you've got there. So, um, stick that on your uh, weekly podcast list for the listeners. It's a great one. <laughs> I appreciate that. Anytime, brother. Anytime.